either a visitor or a resident. Few have not heard of Jesmond Dean. Rustic relaxation, childhood play, or dog walking away from traffic, Jesmond Dean offers a break from hectic life. The Dean follows the course of the Ouseburn, flowing into the River Tyne to the south. It is bounded on the western side by Hadrick's Mill Road. We'll hear more about grain mills later. Here on the edge of the Dean is the real tennis court, built by the Nobles family in 1894, one of only six in the country at the time. Castle Farm Bridge carries traffic over the glaciated river gorge at the site of the farm of the same name. It was built by Dr. Hedlum in 1850 to bypass the route near his house. It was around this time that Lord William Armstrong, the wealthy engineer and armaments manufacturer, bought the land along the burn to create a grand garden, complete with rock formations, waterfalls and grottos. Armstrong became wealthy from making guns, ships and other machines of war, selling them to whomever would buy them. His worldwide trade from the Elzig works made him a multi-billionaire by today's standards. Lord Armstrong provided the cash, but it was his wife, Margaret, who transformed the semi-industrial land into the joy it is today. Armstrong made the Dean a gift to the people of Newcastle. The then Prince of Wales, later to become Edward VII, and Alexandra, Princess of Wales, officiated at the ceremony in 1884. Today, mature trees and exotic plants line the paths along the way. The ever-present burn accompanies the bird song with sometimes a murmur or at other times a roar as it passes over weirs and waterfalls. It is here that we go through the tunnel to enter Blackberry Crags, or simply the quarry. The quarry predates Armstrong's work here he adapted it to be a Chinese garden. The quarry was worked for high-quality sandstone, used for grinding wheels both here and abroad. Sandstone is formed when quartz grains fall from suspension in water or other media. The grains gather to be compacted by later deposits. Silica and calcium carbonate seep between the grains to form binding cement making the rock we see today. Here the sandstone was deposited 300 million years ago on the bed of a warm, shallow sea. Later, about 10,000 years ago, glaciers carved out the valley, moving mountainous quantities of material in their progress. Returning to the main path, we can glimpse Dean House, Armstrong's residence for visiting dignitaries. Today it is a hotel and restaurant. The stepping stones, set in a shallow section of the burn, provide fun for the younger ones. Armstrong created the waterfall to make a more picturesque view, as well as to divert the flow away from the then defunct grain mill nearby. There's been a mill here since the 13th century, but the present building dates from the early 1800s. 
It passed from grain production to grinding flint for a pottery works near the mouth of the burn. The fine flint powder was used as a glaze for the pots. Grinding stopped when Armstrong bought the land in 1862. The wheel we see today is a replica installed in 1994. From the mill we cross the burn to take a slight detour to visit the grotto. Created at the same time as the waterfall, the grotto is made to appear deep. Lady Armstrong was said to have been delighted at the astonishment and horror of everyone that came upon the scene. From the gloom of the grotto we pass on to the airy space that is Maypole Field, popular for picnics. The tidy pavilion provides a welcome rest and comfort facilities. The double bridge to the south of Maypole Field is where the ancient wagonway passed over the burn. Armstrong built a wider crossing as part of his proposed carriage route through the park. The main continuation of that proposed carriage route is the Red Walk. This is the part most visitors will see. The charm of the park can be appreciated without scrambling over rocks or suffering wet feet. 10,000 years ago, after the glaciers had retreated, this valley was covered in a dense forest of oak, ash and hazel trees, populated by wolves, bears and wild boar. We have global warming, or should I say the interglacial Holocene period, to thank for today's tranquil surroundings. go over that bridge to arrive at the banqueting hall. This place of entertainment for Lord Armstrong's guests was built by John Dobson in 1862. However, it's been many years since anyone dined here. It fell into dereliction. Shame on you, Newcastle Council! So that by 1977, the cost of repairs put off for so long was thought to be too much.
It is maintained as a so-called controlled ruin, used as a workshop for local artists and stonemasons. High above the burn, at the top of the steep banks, stands the ruin of the chapel of Our Lady of Jesmond, or St. Mary's Chapel. Some say that the name of this district, Jesmond, derives from this place as it was once called Jesus' Mound. This is the oldest place of worship in Newcastle, dating from the 12th century. The oldest working church is St Andrew's in Newgate Street. The chapel is documented in the Assize Roll, telling how five clerics helped a criminal escape from Newcastle Jail to sanctuary at Tynemouth Priory. This chapel was part of the priory. At Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries, it was sold to Sir Robert Brandling, who used the building as a stable. The chapel has been a place of pilgrimage for centuries. It is said that miracles of healing took place here. The main road from the Tyne crossing through Newcastle, Pilgrim Street, is so named as it is on the route here. People still place tributes here, as well as attending a yearly organised pilgrimage, culminating in a service in this tiny chapel. A short distance from the chapel, now surrounded by 1930s housing, is the little spring, delivering that miracle water. It is believed by some to cure all sorts of ailments. During the 18th century, this bathing place was constructed. The original well was where that wooden cross now stands. It was acquired by Newcastle Corporation in 1932. Neglect and deterioration then took over until a clearance and half-hearted restoration in 1982. Today's trickle is more likely to be used by mendicants rather than pilgrims. At the southern end of the original Armstrong Dean, the east-west road to the coast crosses the steep valley. Lady Armstrong took pity on the horses heaving the heavy wagons up the bank, so suggested a bridge across the chasm. It was designed and built at the Elswick Works, opening for traffic in April 1878. Heavy motorised traffic still used the steep Benton Bank, but light cars used the bridge until 1963. Benton Bank has been superseded by the Cradlewell Bypass, built amidst conservation controversy in 1993. Lord William Armstrong, who lived from 1810 until 1900, was an engineer and amateur inventor. He championed the use of hydraulics as a means of transmitting power. He also experimented with the newfangled electricity, championing hydroelectric generation as well as Joseph Swan's incandescent light bulb. He was not a warmonger. He made machines that people wanted. There's no profit in making widgets nobody will buy. He sold his ships, guns, steam engines and civil engineering to anyone prepared to pay, often driving a hard bargain. Millfield House, originally home to the owner of a small ironworks, later became a mill. The house fell into disrepair, only to be clutched from the jaws of collapse in 1988 by the council. 
It is a visitor's centre, cafe and ranger's base. From the profit of others' warmongering propensities comes this oasis of peace amidst a modern, bustling city.